ever get the feeling that like there's just too much information out there? Yeah. I mean, it's like every day there's something new to learn. Yeah. Definitely like information overload. Yeah. And so that's kind of why we do this, you know, with the deep dive. It's like we try to like really dig into the stuff that's worth knowing. Yeah. The stuff that's really going to make you think. And today we're talking about something that might seem really, really basic. But uh, it, it turns out it's like a window into all this really cool stuff about human history and culture. Yeah. We're talking about knots. Knots. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, they're everywhere. You know, you've got your shoelaces, you've got, you know. Sailors. Sailors, yeah, rigging on boats, all sorts of things. But there's this new study that came out, um, actually it was accepted for publication just last December in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal. Oh, wow. And it's really gotten people thinking about knots in a whole new way. So this isn't just like some, you know, old dusty history. This is. No, this is cutting edge. This is like the latest thing. So what is it about knots? What's so special about them that we're going to spend like, you know, a whole episode talking about them? Well, so basically the researchers, uh, they put together this huge database of over 300 different knots from all around the world and all different time periods. Wow. 300 knots. That's a lot. That's a lot of knots, right? Can't even imagine. But here's the really fascinating part. What they found is that even though you have all these different cultures and all these different time periods separated by huge distances and thousands of years, there's actually a pretty small set of like basic knots that just keeps popping up everywhere. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. One of the researchers, Felix Reed, he he put it this way. He said, uh, the world over people tend to make the same set. It has implications for a shared history of not tying across potentially all of humanity hmm yeah i can see why they'd say that like if people all over the world are coming up with the same knots independently that really does suggest that there's something kind of fundamental going on there absolutely yeah so like how do you even go about studying something like this i mean you were saying knots they're made out of like you know string and rope that stuff decays right it's not like pottery shards that are going to last for thousands of years yeah so the the materials that ancient people would have used to tie knots you know things like plant fibers animal sinew they they just don't survive very well in the archaeological record right so how do you know what knots they were tying yeah if you don't have the actual knots right so that's one of the big challenges in this field and on top of that there hasn't really been a good system for researchers to even compare knots from different parts of the world you know, in a standardized way. Right. So it's been kind of a a messy field to study. So, like, how did they overcome that in this study? Well, so that's where this guy Rup Koronin comes in. He's one of the researchers on the team. And he basically dedicated himself to creating this massive database of knots. Wow. Over 300 of them. And then they use this really clever mathematical technique called Gauss coding to kind of categorize and compare all these different knots. Okay, now you're going to have to explain that one to me because math is not my strong suit. I hear you. Yeah, so Gauss coding, it sounds really complicated, but it's actually a pretty simple idea at its core. Imagine you've got a simple overhand knot, you know, the first knot most people learn how to tie. Yeah. So with gas coding, what you do is you basically look at every point where the rope crosses over itself and you assign it a number. Okay. And then you use a plus or minus sign to indicate whether the rope is going over or under at that point. So for example, that overhand knot, its Gauss code might look something like, you know, negative one, two, negative three, one, negative two, three. Okay. So each number is like crossing point and then the sign tells you which way the rope is going. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So you end up with this kind of numerical fingerprint for each knot. Interesting. And then what the team did, which is really smart is they broke down these longer codes into shorter like two number pairs okay kind of like looking at uh short sequences in dna oh wow and by comparing these little pairs of numbers they could see how similar different knots were okay so that's how they were able to compare all these knots from different places in different times exactly yeah and what did they find like when they did all this comparing what what kind of patterns emerged well so this is where it gets really exciting they found Dozens of knots that had the exact same Gauss code, even though they were from completely different parts of the world and sometimes separated by thousands of years. Whoa. Like, for example, the sheet bend. It's a really common knot used in fishing nets and sailing. Okay. They found over 20 instances of this exact same knot with the same Gauss code in places like the Pacific Islands, South America, and even historical sites in Finland. That's incredible. So are they saying that, like... People in Finland and South America were like 
trading knots with each other or something? The, the, the big question, right? How did the same knot end up in all these different places? So there's two main possibilities. One is what they call cultural transmission. Like maybe the knowledge of how to tie this knot was passed down through trade routes or migration or something like that. Right. But the other possibility is what they call independent invention. So basically, people in different parts of the world facing similar problems, like needing to join two ropes together or create a loop, they just independently figured out the same solution. Hmm. So it's like, you know, two people on opposite sides of the world inventing the wheel at the same time. Exactly. Yeah. Wow, that's mind-blowing. And in the case of the sheep bend, especially with it showing up in such distant places, Coronan and his colleagues, they think that independent invention is the more likely explanation. Wow, so people were just like figuring out the same knots all over the world without ever talking to each other? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So how far back does this knot tying thing go? Right. Like, do we know when people first started tying knots? So direct evidence of ancient knots is pretty rare, like we were saying, because that, that cordage material decays. Right. But there is some really interesting indirect evidence. There are these beads from Blombo's cave in South Africa. They're at least 70,000 years old. And archeologists have looked at them under a microscope and they found wear patterns that suggest that they were strung together using overhand knots. Oh, wow, so people were tying knots like way, way back. Yeah, at least 70,000 years ago, maybe even longer. That's crazy, so what does that tell us? Like, why is it important to know that people were tying knots so long ago? Well, it leads to some really fascinating questions about human cognition, like, did the act of tying knots actually play a role in the evolution of our brains? Really? Yeah. One of the researchers, Felix Reed, he said, tying a knot is finger math, if you will. Finger math. I like that. Yeah. So the idea is that by physically manipulating these ropes and creating these three-dimensional structures with their hands, our ancestors were engaging in a kind of early problem solving and spatial reasoning. Right. And that this might have actually helped to lay the groundwork for the development of more complex cognitive abilities like mathematics and abstract thought. Wow. So like tying knots is like a brain workout for early humans. In a way, yeah. And if you think about it, not tying predates other forms of algorithmic thinking that we know of, like formal number systems and written language. Hmm, that's true. So it's possible that knot tying was one of the earliest ways that humans started to develop those kinds of abstract thinking skills. That's fascinating. Yeah, it really makes you think about the connections between like our physical actions and our mental abilities. Definitely. So, okay, we've talked about the practical side of knots and how they might have even helped our brains evolve. But knots are also like more than just tools, mm -hmm. right? Like they have all this cultural meaning and symbolism too. Absolutely, yeah. Knots show up in all sorts of cultural contexts. You know, they're in myths and legends, and they're often used to symbolize things like connection and commitment and relationships. Like when we say tie the knot to refer to marriage. Right, right. And it goes way beyond that, like the Inca Klipu. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. That yeah. was like their system of writing, right? It was kind of a system of writing, but instead of using letters, they used knots. So they would tie these knots in different colored strings and use them to record all sorts of information. Wow. So it was like a whole system of communication and data storage all based on knots. Exactly. Yeah. They could record things like statistical data, historical narratives, census information. That's incredible. It's a really sophisticated system. So they were basically like writing with knots. Yeah. You could say that. That's so cool. Yeah. And it wasn't just the Inca, right? Like there are other examples of cultures using knots for symbolic purposes. Oh, yeah, definitely. The study talks about how in the Marquesas Islands, they used knots for genealogical mnemonics. So basically, they would tie these specific knot patterns to help them remember their family lineage. Oh, wow, that's interesting. So it's like each knot represents a different ancestor or something? Yeah. Something like that. That's really cool. And then, of course, there's all the decorative knot work that you see in different cultures. Right, yeah, you've got things like Polynesian Senate, Japanese Mizuhiki, Celtic knot work. That's all so beautiful and intricate. It is, yeah. It shows that knots can be more than just functional. They can also be works of art. Absolutely. And you even see knots depicted in ancient art too, right? Yeah, sometimes going back thousands of years. Wow, so it seems like knots have always held a kind of fascination for people. Yeah, for sure. And there's the folklore aspect too, like the story of the Gordian knot. You know, that really intractable problem that Alexander the Great supposedly solved by just cutting it apart. Oh, yeah, right. And in ancient medicine, knots were used for things like surgical procedures and slings and tourniquets. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So it's like knots have been woven into the fabric of human culture for like 
forever. Yeah, they really have. So out of all these hundreds of knots that they looked at, are there any that kind of stand out as being like the most common or the most important? Yeah, so they identified what they call a staple set of cross-cultural knots. These are the knots that show up most frequently across different cultures and time periods. Okay, which ones are those? Well, the most common one is probably no surprise. It's the overhand knot. Yeah, that one's like knot tying 101. Exactly, yeah. And then you've got the reef knot, which is sometimes called the square knot. Okay. And the sheet bend, which we were talking about earlier. Right, right. And then you've got the cow hitch and the clove hitch. Okay, so those are like the, the basic driving blocks of knot tying. Pretty much, yeah. And it's interesting that the sheet bend is so prevalent because it's a bit more complex than some of those other basic knots. Yeah, that's true. So what's the deal with that? Like, why is the sheet bend so popular? Well, they think that, especially in Austronesian cultures, it was really important for fishing nets. Oh, interesting. And so it's possible that the knowledge of how to tie this knot was spread through those maritime networks. Okay, that makes sense. And there's also archaeological evidence of sheet bends in ancient European fishing nets. Like, there's this amazing net called the Entrea net. It's over 10,000 years old. Wow, that's so old. I know, right? And it's made with sheet bends. So that's a pretty long-lasting knot. Yeah, it stood the test of time. So are there any knots that are, like, surprisingly rare? Like, knots that you might think would be really common but actually aren't? Yeah, actually, there are a couple that stand out. Like, the ball line knot. Okay. That's a really useful knot for creating a secure loop that doesn't slip. It's really popular today in all sorts of fields like sailing and climbing. Yeah. But it's actually pretty rare in the historical record. Oh, that's weird. Why is that? Well, they think that maybe it's because the other knots that people were already using were just good enough for their needs. Right. Like if you've already got a knot that works, why bother inventing a new one? True. And there's also this idea of what they call the fail-proof mandate. So basically in situations where a knot failing could be really dangerous, like if you're sailing or climbing, oh, yeah. there's a strong incentive to stick with the knots that you know are reliable. Right. You don't want to be experimenting with new knots when your life is on the line. Exactly. So it's like knots have to be really, really reliable in order to catch on. Yeah, especially in those high stakes situations. That makes sense. And they contrast this with things like string figures. Oh yeah, like Cat's Cradle and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. With string figures, there's a lot more variation and experimentation across cultures. Hmm. I wonder why that is. Well, probably because it's not as high stakes. Yeah. Like if you mess up a string figure, it's not the end of the world. Right, it's just for fun. Exactly, yeah. So there's more room for creativity and playfulness. Okay, that makes sense. So it seems like the knots that have survived and spread the most are the ones that are both reliable and versatile. Like a Swiss army knife of knots. Exactly, yeah. yeah. The study actually uses that analogy. That's great. So you've got your sheet bend for joining ropes together. You've got your reef knot for tying things up. Right. Your overhand knot for all sorts of basic stuff. Right. Your cow hitch and clove hitch for attaching ropes to things. Okay, so it's like each knot has its own specialty, but they can all be used for a variety of tasks too. Exactly, yeah. They're like the multi-tools of the knot world. Mm, I like that. And then you have more specialized knots that develop in specific cultures for specific purposes. Mm. Like the Samami people in Scandinavia, they have all these special knots for reindeer herding. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. It's really fascinating how the environment and the culture can shape the development of knot tying techniques. Definitely. So, okay, we've talked about how knots are useful and versatile mm -hmm. and how they might have even played a role in our cognitive evolution. But the study also gets into some really interesting stuff about, like, our preferences when it comes to knots. Oh, yeah. Like how some knots are more popular than others, even if they're not necessarily better. Right. So there's this really interesting example with the reef knot and the granny knot. Okay. I know those. So they both look pretty similar. They're both made by tying two overhand knots. Right. But the reef knot is a much more secure knot. Yeah, the granny knot is, like, notorious for coming undone. Exactly, yeah. But interestingly, some studies have shown that the granny knot might actually be easier for people to tie instinctively. Yeah, so, like, if you just ask someone to tie two ropes together without showing them how to do it, they're more likely to tie a granny knot than a reef knot. Hmm. That's weird. So why is the reef knot more common if the granny knot is easier to tie? Well, that's a really good question. And it suggests that over time, people have learned to recognize and prefer the reef knot 
even though it might not be as intuitive at first. Right. So it's like cultural evolution in action. Exactly. Yeah. Like people have figured out through experience and observation that the reef knot is just a better knot. Right. It works better so it gets passed down. Exactly. That's really cool. And there's also that thing about the Navajo people, right? Like they have a taboo against the granny knot. Oh, yeah, that's right. They associate the granny knot with death. Wow. So it's like a really powerful example of how cultural beliefs and values can shape our attitudes towards even something as seemingly simple as a knot. Definitely. It's like knots are more than just knots. They're like these little bundles of cultural meaning. Absolutely, yeah. And the study actually talks about knots as a form of what they call ethnomathematical knowledge. Okay, now you're just making up words. I know it sounds complicated, but it's basically just the idea that different cultures have their own ways of understanding and using mathematical principles, even if they don't express them in the same way that we do in like formal mathematics. Okay, so it's like math, but not math. Kind of, yeah. Like, for example, the way that knots are used in fishing nets, the way that they're oriented and connected, it's not random. It actually reflects a deep understanding of topology and how to create a structure that's strong and efficient. Yeah. And the Inca Kupu is another great example of ethnomathematical thinking. Right. It's a whole system of communication and record keeping that's based on these really complex knot patterns. Right. So it's like knots are a way of encoding information and knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not just the Inca. There are other examples of cultures using knots for things like counting and record keeping. So it's possible that knot making was actually one of the early catalysts for the development of mathematical thinking in general. Hmm. That's really interesting. So it's like knots are more than just tools. They're like these little engines of cognitive development. Yeah, you could say that. That's amazing. It really makes you appreciate the humble knot. Definitely. And the study actually goes even further and talks about knots as cognitive technologies. Cognitive technologies. What does that even mean? Well, it's basically the idea that knots are not just products of our intelligence. They also help to shape our intelligence. Oh, wow. Like, by using knots, we're constantly engaging in these little acts of problem solving and spatial reasoning. Right. And that can actually help to strengthen those cognitive abilities. So it's like a feedback loop. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Knots help us to think better, and then our better thinking helps us to create even more complex and sophisticated knots. Wow, that's really cool. It's like knots are these little tools that have been helping us to evolve for like tens of thousands of years. Yeah, and the fact that there's this core set of knots that's shared across so many different cultures suggests that they've been really important for human innovation and progress. Right. It's like they're these little building blocks of civilization. Exactly, yeah. And it really makes you think about all the other seemingly mundane objects that might have played a similar role in shaping who we are. Right. Like what other hidden histories are lurking out there just waiting to be discovered? Exactly. Well, I think we've just about untangled this knotty topic. I think so. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the world of knots. It's been really eye-opening. Yeah, it's amazing how much you can learn from something as simple as a knot. So next thing you tie your shoelaces or see a knot in a piece of rope, Take a moment to appreciate the long and fascinating history that's tied up in that little loop. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a connection to our ancestors and to the shared human experience. Thanks for listening. Thanks for having me. And we'll see you next time on The Deep Dive. See ya.